great. Hi, all. And to reiterate Shane's comments, really thank you for taking the time out of your day for what will hopefully be an uh, informative and interesting session as we go along. I know psychometrics and statistics don't get everyone quite as excited as they get me, but hopefully the content that I present here today will be useful for you and applicable to the programs that everyone is working on. Um, as Shane mentioned, we will be going through a significant amount of content as we go through, so please do um, send in those questions as we go through if there's something I'm, I'm discussing that you want further follow-up on or perhaps an applied example, happy to address any and all questions after we get through the planned content here today. Okay, so on today's call, we have three main topics of discussion that we're going to be talking about in terms of methods and statistical approaches. In particular, with regards to psychometric analyses, we're going to be covering the most effective and advantageous methods for beta testing of test items and forms prior to live or operational administration of those forms. We're going to be also discussing statistical methods that can be used to identify poorly performing items and removing them from your item pool, in addition to just gathering general item level and form level statistics to confirm that your forms and items are performing as intended and as they were developed throughout your exam development process. We're also going to be discussing statistical methods that can be used to create new test forms that are comparable with both historical forms and parallel to one another if you're in a situation where you're releasing multiple operational forms at once. Some topics we'll be covering is the importance of data testing. It is in some fields kind of a given in education, for example, field testing almost goes without saying. In some other fields, such as IT certification, where I primarily spend my time, um, the practice of data testing is kind of coming into some debate in terms of kind of efficacy and usefulness in terms of comparison to the resources that are needed to expend it. So we'll discuss some of those kind of issues that are ongoing in testing industry. We'll also talk about how item analyses can guide item decisions and future development activities and how that can be conducted post beta testing in addition to as part of a planned exam maintenance program for your exam. And then we're also going to talk about the importance of both initial forms assembly and forms reassembly in your test development process. So we're going to start off with beta testing. In terms of the stage of the exam development process that we're looking in, we'll be focusing on the psychometric analyses and operations for the purpose of this session. So as you can see, looking at the validity-centered exam development process that Alpine advocates and utilizes, um, we will be starting farther along the wheel than when the exam development process actually starts all the way over at the pretest and analyze the fourth from the bottom, fourth from the end of the cycle um, in the process. However, it's important to note as we launch into kind of the data testing on the back end of exam analysis, um, all of the critical exam development and validation processes that would have occurred up to this point. So by us focusing on starting with psychometric analyses of data testing, by no means am I trying to discount any of the important work that would have gone into reaching this stage in the process. As we all know, the time, effort, and resources put into the structure, design, and definition of the exam are key to ensure that the published exam forms align with the intended interpretation and uses of the test scores. For today's intent of this program, though, we will just be discussing um, from the pre-test and analyze stage on. So when we're discussing data testing, what are we really talking about here? Essentially, we're looking to gather evidence on the appropriateness of the items to the content specifications and the intended use of test scores. Essentially, it answers the need to collect statistical data on item performance prior to the score status of those items. There's multiple ways that you may be able to collect data on items after they're being delivered. Perhaps it may be in a situation of a beta exam and or it may be in a circumstance where you have an operational exam of a form, but you have a content area in particular, let's say, where there's a necessary update or upgrade based on a change in the content domain. In that case, it may be more appropriate to speed pilot items. Sorry, I'm just seeing the note about my microphone, so I'm going to turn that up. Hopefully that'll be better for people. 
So in terms of whether or not you would be piloting items through a beta test or seeding those items, the appropriate method to use will likely depend on a majority of factors, but two in particular. One will be the stage within the test development cycle that you're in, whether this is a new exam that you're developing or a complete overhaul of an existing exam, or again, if you're in more of an update or an upgrade situation. And to that end, you would be looking initially at the extent of new content that needs analysis when you'd be making the decision between a beta test and seeding pilot items. To the extent that you have a majority of your content that will be turning over, you may be in a situation where you want to be conducting a beta exam either concurrently with or in place of your operational exam for a period of time to be able to collect new data, new statistics on that largely new bank of items. If it's a smaller percentage of your blueprint, you can probably get away with seeding those pilot items and collecting statistics without disrupting the operational status of your exam. In terms of what we're looking to accomplish through beta testing, we're looking to verify that the items are functioning correctly in a de delivery environment. We're looking to also gauge the fairness of the items for all candidates in terms of both difficulty and discrimination. And we're also allowing for time for adjustments to be made for poorly performing items prior to including them on an operational exam. In terms of the exam release cycle, the beta item analysis is going to occur before operational forms assembly and any exam maintenance activities. Again, the beta test administration will allow for the formative evaluation of test development, administration, and reporting. You're able to collect candidate data that will provide both initial quantitative and we tend to recommend qualitative exam feedback. And the way that we normally advocate for gathering that qualitative feedback is through allowing those data candidates to provide comments as they go through either on particular items or on the exam form as a whole to give some context to any um, flags that we may discuss later um, to really give some kind of candidate perspective to what we may be seeing as anomalous behavior in terms of the statistics. The beta item administration will be followed up with a beta item selection analysis, in which case we can evaluate item and test performance. And we'll be talking more about this in the next segment of the presentation. This again allows us to diagnose potential issues with item wording, such as faulty or distracting information in your stems or your item distractors, any issues with scoring in terms of your key or perhaps um, option analyses with regard to individual item distractors that may not be performing operationally as intended during your item writing workshop. And then also gauge the relationship between particular items and the entire exam to really gauge the extent to which these items are collectively adding up to a cohesive exam on the domain of interest. These statistics will enable a selection of the final items that could be considered viable for operational forms assembly and release. In some fields, as I discussed, the, the decision whether or not to beta test is really based on a competing set of factors. I've listed out some of the pros and cons here, of course, with my personal bias that um, when time, effort, and, and resources allow having those empirical statistics prior to operational release is preferable. Of course, there's always business constraints that need to be considered. Um, there's also circumstances with regards to timeline and or size of, let's say, the candidate pool um, that may dictate that a beta test should not be or could not be conducted in an operational setting. Um, but I've listed out here just some kind of typical pros and cons that exam programs need to weigh against when they're deciding whether or not the beta test. Again, this is more of a consideration in certain certification and credentialing fields. IT certification, again, my area of expertise in particular, um, has really been grappling with the need for and the ability to beta test in a lot of our operational exam settings for the past five to ten years. Again, in a field such as education, field testing is fairly standard and somewhat assumed that it will be um, a part of the process going forward.
with regards to the number of beta forms that should be released, it's important to talk to a psychometrician or another trusted advisor, technical advisor for your exam program when determining the appropriate number of data forms to administer, because there's multiple competing factors that may be interacting in that decision. And again, I've listed off here, and as Shane mentioned, the PDF will be available of these slides, of some of the goals and trade-offs that you may be facing in terms of wanting to be parsimonious with regards to the number of data forms that you're releasing, Again, you may have issues about exposure of your exams. You may have beta candidate fatigue issues that you're worried about with regards to your item pool. Um, you may have kind of concerns about proportionally meeting your blueprint. This kind of goes through what some of the goals are of your beta test and then what some of those trade-offs might be for you. Again, with all of these multiple factors that may be going on, there is not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. So I'm not gonna sit here today and say, always go with one beta exam, always go with two with 10 to 20 percent overlap or something like that. It really does depend on the purpose of your exam, the size of your candidate pool, the size of your item bank, and some other factors such as kind of your schedule and timeline in terms of exam updates and refresh in terms of what's really appropriate when it comes to beta testing for your particular exam and exam program. And this graphic is really just to show that once the decision has been made with regards to the number of data forms that are going to be released should you move forward with a beta um, exam, there's multiple considerations that can go into rescore. So there's multiple approaches. And again, you would want to work with a technical advisor or a psychometrician within your exam program in addition to your exam delivery provider. Um, there are certain constraints, there's certain contract language that is sometimes written in with exam delivery provider contracts um, that may limit and or necessitate an additional charge to explore some of these beta rescore considerations, which is important to know going into the initial design of the beta exam and deciding the number of forms, as we may be limited on the back end in terms of form assembly in terms of how we're able to combine items within or across beta forms. A couple of options just for consideration in terms of how beta candidate rescores may be approached. One approach may be to use all acceptable items administered to each candidate. So, so this would be all of the kept items coming out of an item selection, let's say, even those not used on a final form. Another approach may be to use only those acceptable items that are then included on a final operational form. You could use a subset of acceptable items that are balanced to meet the blueprint proportionally. Another option may be using a subset of acceptable items that are equivalent to the forms, the final forms in terms of difficulty. So again, just to point out, beta testing and kind of beta candidate resource considerations can sometimes be more layered and dynamic in terms of what's appropriate for your exam program than what might be just traditionally considered a one-size-fits-all approach. It should be noted that for this slide and the preceding four slides are focused on a situation in which beta candidates will be receiving an operational score, either immediately or perhaps in a delayed fashion for their performance on that beta exam. Again, kind of comparing what's going on in credentialing and certification to what may be happening in, say, an education realm, um, students who take field test forms frequently only receive minimal feedback on their performance. And normally those um, exam settings, settings cannot be used as evidence of performance for live, score, live form scoring. Um, this is how it's traditionally been going in education. Interestingly enough, however, in recent policy discussions, there's been a movement against testing for no good reason in response to kind of the abundance of exams that a lot of students are exposed to today. And therefore, some changes may be forthcoming in education, moving away from the practice that those students that are sitting for field tests um, are not able to then apply those performances to their live form performance. That's a quick overview of beta testing. Again, happy to answer any questions um, once we've run through item and form analysis and then forms assembly. But hopefully that gives you at least a good overview of the types of 
considerations that can go into deciding when and whether to data test and the types of data testing that you may be interested in conducting for your particular program. We're going to move on now to item and form analysis and statistics. Again, I realize that I might be in an anomaly on the phone with the extent to which psychometrics and statistics really excite me. So I'm going to give everyone an overview of the types of statistics that you may be exposed to and seeing about your exam program and your exams, um, either internally from somebody who's running these types of analyses or from a vendor such as Alpine who may be running them for you, without getting too down far into the nitty-gritty of the formulas and, and intricacies like that. If anyone on the call is interested, I'm happy to talk to them and about them, about the different approaches we use. Um, again, I'm trying to give more of an overview in terms of a comprehensive guide to the types of things you may be looking for and what they might be indicative of in terms of your exam. But again, details, more details are always available and welcome to discuss. Item and form level analysis can actually occur within two different stages in your exam development process. As you can see in this graphic here, I actually have two different areas in the exam development process circle as we're actually typically engaged in doing some type of item and form level analysis following an initial alpha or beta test, and then again as a part of a routine exam maintenance cycle. In Alpine lingo, just in case I get confusing because I may slip back into using it, we typically call the item and form level analysis after an initial beta exam an item selection, and any item and form level analysis that's conducted after an operational exam at the health check. So if you hear me use those two terms, the types of item and form level analyses are 99% the same that are included in those. That's just where the differing language comes from. So I apologize in advance if I slip back into my non-generic habit. With regards to item and form level analyses, item analyses in particular result in item level statistics that drive item selection decisions and influence future item development activities. Your form level analyses are going to provide you with form level statistics that really give an indication as to the performance of your forms in operational settings, in particular in situations where you have multiple forms in administration. Your key statistics that you're going to be interested in is the level of balance or parallelness between your forms with regards to key statistics. And on upcoming slides, I'll show you the key statistics that psychometricians here at Alpine tend to point to as kind of the most critical in order to evaluate the extent to which forms are performing in parallel and can be considered equal and fair in terms of um, dual administration for candidates. In terms of item and form level analyses, I've, I've offered up here six different um, essential pieces of evidence, pieces of validity evidence that conducting these types of analyses on a routine basis can really provide your exam program. First and foremost, we're always interested in the alignment of your performance of your exam to the intended use and interpretation of your test scores. Therefore, number one on my list is adherence to the defined purpose of the exam. Again, we're also looking at the quality of psychometric and statistical attributes, both for individual items and for those forms of the cohesive whole. Again, within the form itself and across forms if you're looking at a multiple form situation. You may be looking to gauge the appropriateness of your standard setting results and decision to see how that cut score that was decided upon, preferably through some type of um, procedural standard setting process, how that's actually playing out operationally. Is your anticipated impact in terms of where you're setting your cut score actually aligning with a desired pass rate? Or is there some kind of tweaking and further investigation that needs to be happening in order to figure out kind of where the misalignment between your desired cut score and what's happening operationally with that is kind of breaking apart. In IT certification in particular, as well as in other fields, but really in IT, it's a major concern. Exposure and security review is of major concern. We know that forms are often released within um, you know, days if not hours after operational release to kind of brain dump sites and really keeping a, a keen eye on what's going on with exposure and security is, is really key um, to the continued validity of those exams. We're often interested in evaluating the fairness of our items in our form. 
this is key again in education, but it's also applicable across the board um, and it's something that should really be a key consideration for, for exam programs across the board. And again, to what extent is our operational exam aligning with the policy and administrative goals of really what the exam program was set out to do initially when it was, when it was developed? So in thinking through item and four level analyses, again, it allows for the validation that the interpretation of exam scores remain appropriate over time. You can make informed decisions regarding the health of the exam. You can engage in future planning for the test program, including setting plans for forms, maintenance, and content refresh cycles, the type of information you're going to gain from statistics included in an item and form level analysis are really key to making those informed decisions around really what makes sense for the future life and health of your exam. And another key piece of evidence, if you're in a situation where you're accredited or let's say are on a annual or biannual schedule to release technical manuals, the types of statistics that are included in your item and form level analyses are really solid evidence and proof that you could contain in those technical manuals to support the validity and ongoing utility of your exam to its intended purpose. Again, the types of statistics I'll be highlighting over the next few slides will really be looking at um, the use of the exam, that will really be a form level statistic. The performance of the exam, we'll be looking at both item and form level statistics that point to that. And exposure. In the case that we're discussing here, which is kind of comprehensive statistics but not really a deep dive, exposure will really be dealt with at a form level um, approach, although that's not to say and certainly is not excluding very valuable item level exposure approaches that a lot of exam programs are including in their item and form level analysis. So now I'm going to quickly run through um, typical statistics that, that you may be receiving on an item and form level analysis, either from Alpine as a vendor or, again, another vendor internally. One key statistic that a lot of exam programs are interested in is item difficulty. Two main ways to establish item difficulty on an exam. The one that most exam programs are familiar with is classical test theory, also known as CTT, or item response theory. IRT, and I'll be talking about both in terms of um, statistics that you may be seeing. With regard to classical test theory, the two statistics that are typically presented are p-values, which most people on this call are probably very familiar with, which are typically used for dichotomous items, and then average item scores. Average item scores are a way of looking at average item difficulty from a classical perspective when your items may be worth more than one point. So in a situation where you may have multi-point dichotomous items and or you may have polygamous items. Again, for p-values, a one or 100% indicates that all examinees answered the item correctly. A 0% indicates that no examinees answered the item correctly. For average item score, you're basically looking at the sum of examinee item scores divided by the number of examinees, such that your range is going to be from zero to the maximum number of points possible for that item. And the difficulty can be interpreted along that scale of maximum number of points. So let's say that you had a four-point item, and an average item score of, let's say, a 1.0 would be indicative of a fairly easy item, whereas a average item score of, let's say, a 3.5 reverse that. A 1.0 would be indicative of a fairly difficult item, a 3.5 would be indi indicative of a fairly easy item as most of your candidates are scoring higher along the scale. Difficulty values can be used to evaluate the quality of test items, as we'll talk a little bit later in terms of parameters and flagging of items. If you're really looking to have a cohesive, parsimonious exam that includes items that are only giving you a lot of information about your candidates. Any item that says, let's say, a, has a p-value of higher than, let's say, a 0.9 is not really providing to you a lot of information about your candidates, as 90% of your candidates would therefore be answering that item correctly. It's not discriminating that well between your candidates because the vast majority of your candidates are getting that item correctly. On the flip side, 
an item that's very difficult with, let's say, a point one or 10% of your candidates answering it correctly, again, for reverse reasons, is not providing a lot of information to you because the majority of your candidates are not answering the item correctly. In those situations, two hard items, you may want to go back with subject matter experts and explore the item in more depth to determine if it really is just an upper echelon question and the expectation will be that a lot of your candidate pool or your MQC would not be answering that item correctly, or an investigation into if there's actually something functionally going on with the item that may be making it difficult for candidates um, to answer that question correctly. In terms of ROSH item difficulty, maybe um, a less familiar term for some people that are on the phone, essentially the ROSH scale, which is the IRT method that Alpine um, uses for the majority of our exams, puts candidate ability and item difficulty on the same scale. Typical scales range from about negative four to four. The item difficulty scale is centered at zero. Therefore, lower ability candidates and easier items would have ROSH measures in the negative range. Higher ability candidates and more difficult items would have items that are in the more positive, high positive range. The benefit of looking at the ROSH item difficulty as opposed to a p-value that assumes the kind of baseline difficulty of all items being the same, this actually takes into consideration the patterns of responses for individual candidates and then calibrates based on that how difficult the items are, taking into context who the candidates are who answered individual items incorrect or correct. It's a more dynamic measure of item difficulty than, say, a basic classical test series of key values. Used in conjunction, though, the two can be very powerful information, and that's how we normally advocate our clients um, review the difficulty measures. Another important statistic is item score correlation, which offers information and inspects how performance on individual item corresponds with performance on the entire exam. The statistic can be used with both dichotomous items. You may hear the term point by serial when you're using dichotomous items and polytomous items. Correlation values for point by serials in particular range from negative one to one, with higher values indicating the item discriminates better between high and low achievers. Positive values indicate those examinees who performed well on the item also performed well on the exam. And those examinees who performed poorly on the items did not perform as well on the exam. Negative correlation indicates that well-performing examinees performed worse on the item than those examinees who performed poorly on the item. Again, just double flagging, what you're hoping for is high positive correlations between an individual item and the total exam score. And total exam score can be um, parameterized in terms of what's most appropriate for your exam design and setting. So for example, it may be total score across scored and unscored items. Sorry, dichotomous means a zero one item or incorrect correct, whereas polytonic is an item that may have multiple score points. So zero, one, two, three, four, let's say for a four point item. I apologize for not defining that earlier. When looking at flagging parameters, we're going to be wanting to keep a keen eye on any items that have no correlation or a negative correlation, as these items are either working with to not add much information to your exam or may actually be detracting from the information you're gathering. Again, these may be items that have option flags. It may be a key issue. It may be a distractor issue that working with subject matter experts, you can go in and actually um, key in what's going wrong and, and make adjustments that may improve the overall item system. With regards to item level reliability, it's a level of internal consistency. Um, it's a combination of the variance in the item scores and the correlation of that item. Again, high positive values is indicate, indicative of the fact the item is contributing to the overall reliability of the exam. Low values is indicative of the fact that there is little to no relationship between what the item is measuring and the rest of the exam. In other words, this item isn't adding much overall to overall exam reliability. Negative values indicate that the item is actually measuring knowledge that is inversely related to what the exam is measuring. 
it's actually reducing your overall exam level reliability. And again, these would be items that would be flagged and would be key to look at in terms of making key sweet decisions and making some decisions around what's causing that item to perform poorly. Response time is a statistic that we commonly look at, which um, is really critical in some exam programs and is kind of less critical in others, um, depending on the extent and the purpose of your exam. In discussing item response time, it's typically the median amount of time, median not mean, that examinees spend on a particular item. In evaluating the quality of items, response time can provide useful information for identifying items that need to be reviewed. As a general rule, a very short response time might indicate something anomalous going on with the items. For example, if overall your entire candidate pool is taking less than 10 seconds on their exam, it might be indicative that a majority of your examinees had prior knowledge of the item content and therefore didn't have to read through the item in order to answer it correctly. On the flip side, if you have an item response time that's very long, again, this may be indicative of confusing or convoluted item wording, distraction options that are actually causing candidates to take longer on the item than would have been anticipated based on the projected difficulty or empirical difficulty of the item. When reviewing your response time, it should really be a comparison of what would be reasonable and expected to the item. For example, you may be expecting faster response times with easier items and longer response times with harder items. If that's the pattern that you're recognizing over the course of your exam over the entire item bank, any item that's not following that pattern might be an item you want to look into in terms of kind of anomalous performance that's going on with it. If there's outliers in terms of a really hard item, it's not taking candidates that long to take and vice versa. You might just want to delve farther into those items to discover if there's something, again, anomalous that's going on that's creating this different pattern and behavior than what's going on with the rest of the item. We've talked somewhat about item flagging as we go along, but in terms of the value of all of these statistics that we just quickly went through, um, item flagging is really key. Um, we typically hear at Alpine flag on um, item difficulty, item score correlation, and then option analysis. I've gone over p-values and option analysis, I mean an item score correlation. Option analysis is, is what I'll be going over on my next slide. In terms of what's presented here, these are typical, these are kind of our standard values. It's important to keep in mind working with um, your internal, again, psychometrician and or um, any external vendor that you're using, these can all be parameterized to what makes sense for your exam. In certain exam programs, 0.9 and 0.1 might make sense. In other exam programs, maybe it's 0.75 and 0.25. Um, here at Alpine, we can completely parameterize that within our item selections and health checks, and it's certainly something in which the intended use and interpretation of test scores should drive um, the extent which we're using. In terms of option analysis, essentially what we're looking at is how well each response option is performing. Either it's the correct response, the key response, or the distractor. Again, we're looking at things that may be anomalous, either to your correct key or distractors with regards to key values, item score correlation, response time, and frequency count. Of particular interest in option analyses are if there's any distractors that are attracting a large percentage of your highly performing candidates and delving down into is that a mystery that's going on or is it just a really well-written item that has two, you know, solid options, one being the key and one being the success. In terms of form level analysis, we're going to go through this pretty quickly because I'll cover some of this in our forms assembly um, discussion as well. But the form level analyses, um, Again, it's really key to compare not only with the in-form, but across-form. The example that I have here today um, is a situation where there was just one exam form, just for ease of, of simplifying some of the key statistics that we're interested in. Again, the mean performance on your exam, this, had a, this exam had a mean performance of 88.93 out of 120. Um, we're looking at the standard deviation, what that 
um, the variability across exam scores. So in this case, 68% of the candidates would have scored within a range of 88 minus 27 and 88 plus 27. Again, what's your total test time? It's important to keep an eye on that to make sure that there's no elements of, let's say, seededness that were not intended that are coming into play and altering or impacting the way that candidates are able to score on the exam. And again, really looking at reliability, and I apologize, my reliability line is pointing to skewness on this um, graph. But essentially looking at the consistency of the items as an entire exam. How will the items on the test seem to be measuring the same knowledge? Here at Alpine, our baseline measure for what we'd be interested in for exam level reliability is a baseline of 0.85. As you can see in this example, the reliability is through the roof, 0.98. Um, which is indicative of little variability across the exam across that. Form level analyses show test level statistics by form. Here's an example where it would have been two forms that are in parallel to each other. And looking at the test characteristic curves and test information functions, I'm not going to get too far into that, but essentially these are two important graphs that come out of the Roche model, that IRT model I described before. And what we would be looking for to say that two forms are um, perfectly coincident or quote unquote perfectly, of course, measurement error always comes into play, would be lines that are perfectly coincident with each other directly on top of one another across the ability continuum. As you can see in these graphs, it's kind of a close but no cigar situation. Um, form A has a pass rate of 80.2%. Form B has a pass rate of 81.4%. Um, we can look at the means. They're close, again, very close, 72 and 72.29. Um, the Roche measure at the cut score, though, in this case, does differ by 0.2. In doing forms assembly, when you're using pre equating using the Roche model, essentially what we would be doing would be ensuring that that cut at your, the Roche measure at your cut score would be exactly coincident. So at the release of these exams, with projected statistics, essentially form A and form B would have been, let's say, all 1.9, and something happened to form B in operational use um, that actually made it a bit easier than form A. Again, form level analysis can show you of any differences in difficulty across your parallel forms, which we would be looking um, to avoid. Again, we want fairness to all candidates on any day they sit for the exam, regardless of the exam form that they are administered. So again, you can either pre or post equate in IT certification. We're often using pre equating in education. It's more common to use post equating. But essentially what we need to do is for any differences in form difficulty, we need to account for those so that candidates are given a fair and equal chance of passing the exam, again, regardless of the form that they're actually administered. With regard to form level analysis, there's actually some other statistics that can be used to provide evidence of exam security or potential compromise. Again, this is a key, key issue in IT certification, but it is applicable to several other fields and exam programs. In terms of some baseline statistics you may be looking for, um, frequency distribution, as you can see in the frequency distribution on the left-hand side, um, this is a highly negative skewed distribution. Essentially, the vast majority of the candidates scored very, very highly on the exam. Exam time by exam score, what we're most interested here is that upper left-hand quadrant, which is indicative of the fact that there were several candidates who scored exceedingly well on the exam in a very short amount of time. Again, this could be considered somewhat anomalous for certain exam programs and may be indicative of suspect. Um, exam behavior that may be going on with your candidates and or your testing center. Moving average scores are also a really great thing to look at. Um, essentially, they show you the trends in scores and performance over time. In this case, you can see there's a strong upward trend in performance over time. Some of this may be natural in terms of, you know, if you're releasing an exam right when a new um, content domain is kind of being discovered or fleshed out, or let's say you're in the IT certification space where it may be a new software or technology, there is some early adopter and kind of acquiescence to that that may happen naturally along the course of the exam administration. However, it may also be indicative of, let's say, um, exposure of your form or something like that that may need to be further investigated. 
So with our last about um, eight minutes that I have here, I want to leave about, you know, 10 to 12 minutes for any questions that have come about from individuals during the course. We're going to talk about forms of assembly and equating. Um, essentially, in thinking about when this occurs within the process, again, it can happen within two stages. To the extent that we were just talking about item and form level analyses in terms of what may come out of the beta exam, we would be looking at the stage in our validity centered exam development process of assembling your operational test. However, once your exams are out and operational, based on volume, based on suspected exposures, um, based on changes in content, you may be looking to refresh um, your content over time, in which case you might be doing an item form level analysis on an operational exam. Again, a health check in Alpine terminology in which case you may be looking to do a forms reassembly of an operational exam, which would fall under that, that final stage in the exam cycle of maintaining your test. Purpose of forms assembly is to determine specifications for live exams, again, either operational or re-released operational forms, including your number of test forms, number of items per form and or points per form if you're in a situation of not fully dichotomous items, and appropriate administration time. Again, to avoid seededness on an exam unless seededness is an explicit purpose of your exam. We're looking to assemble one or more parallel operational forms. Parallel test forms should have equivalent statistical characteristics and proper blueprint representation. At Alpine, the statistics that we're most interested in when we're doing form assembly is again equivalence at the cut score with regard to your rush measures and or mean um, average difficulty over the entire form. We're interested in equivalence and standard deviation of variability. We're interested in equivalence in reliability. And we're interested in equivalence of, of test size. Those are the three, four key statistics we're really interested in. And then again, we're always looking to match to your blueprint to an appropriate level determined um, by the viable number of items in the pool. That could either be to the objective level or to the section or domain or functional group level, um, depending on what's most appropriate based on your item pool and performance. And again, the key to all of this is we're looking to provide fair equated scores resulting in similar score interpretation for all candidates, regardless of the test score you've taken, regardless of the day the exam is taken, regardless of the version of the exam that is taken. Essentially, we need these multiple forms and or equated forms across time, even if there's only one operational form, to be balanced on content, item difficulty, across ability levels, reliability, variance, and testing time, again, to ensure fairness of either pass-fail decisions or placing it into a scoring category if you're, let's say, in an educational realm where you have multiple achievement levels that you're categorizing students in. We're now at the middle of the exam release cycle, um, in which case you would be reviewing exam and form level statistics either from an item selection and or a health check. The items that were not performing well would have been recommended for deletion. Um, we would have a set of viable items. We would be performing some type of an um, equating, let's say, if we were in a situation where we wanted to maintain a consistent cut score from prior versions, or we might be in a situation where we're conducting an additional standard setting if something is fundamentally shifted in terms of the expectations of either your minimally qualified candidate or your barely able um, students at each of your achievement levels. This is just covering the typical forms assembly process. We're at this middle level here where we're assembling equated and balanced forms. Um, typically, those would be released either from an internal psychometrician or technical advisor within your program or for a vendor, and then after which reviewed by the exam program stakeholders and then sent to a test delivery vendor for operational release. Five key considerations in terms of what we're looking to do with our forms assembly. Again, we want to equate the raw score across forms and between versions to ensure fair scoring. We want to balance across content, item and form difficulties, reliability scenarios. If you're in an exam program that uses scale score, we want to appropriately scale 
to increase interpretability and meaning of candidates' raw scores. We're looking to maximize content relevancy and item quality. We're looking to replace older items. We're looking to replace items that may not be performing that well. And we want to replace any items that may have outdated content that is no longer appropriate for the purpose of the exam. We're looking to minimize item exposure. Some ways to do this would be to keep item overlap low and retire items with known performance and or exposure issues. With regards to overlap, recommended overlap between multiple parallel forms at Alpine is typically 10 to 30%. But again, this may be, um, this may vary higher or lower depending on the exact approach to item banking, let's say, that a program has and or um, operational characteristics of the individual items that are on your exam. Equating and scaling in conjunction, I'm not going to get into the visual, but it is here. Um, as it's a bit more technical than we need to get. But just in terms of equating and scaling, it's good to think of the two as a pair, um, as a final step in the process, in which um, equating and scaling can be used in conjunction to have not only equivalent cut scores, by equivalent, I mean effective equivalent cut scores to what we've used before. In other words, it might not be the exact same numbers, but it has the same meaning in terms of the ability of candidates that's needed in order to pass or fail the exam. Once that is said, we can link that to, let's say, a scale four table via scaling, which again maps somewhat to your candidates any kind of behind the scenes um, reconfiguration that's gone on, whether the cut score was equated or not, if there's a new effective cut or not. That forward facing scaled cut score to your candidate, let's say, could be a 300, and that remains the same, and we adjust for the differences in your raw cut scores through the scaling process. Again, it increases interpretability of the scores, and it, again, provides um, a buffer layer, let's say, between your exam um, specifications and what candidates are actually able to see and interpret. The equating process is how differences in difficulty of cross forms can be accommodated. Again, this is to neither happen through pre-equating, where forms are actually built to be equivalent in terms of where they take the target cut score prior to operational release, or they can be post-equated, in which case um, exam forms are, are translated into what would be a similar, um, if, let's say, on a 100 exam form item, item exam form, it may be a 62 on one form and a 64 on the other, or actually what's equivalent between two different versions of the exam. And then candidates can be scored across that. Again, I spent through most of this, but just in terms of scaling, again, ease of the interpretability of exam scores and pass fail decisions. Um, it's important in some situations to the valid interpretation of exam scores. And it can ensure, more, most importantly, it can ensure consistency of the scale score, regardless of administration, version, or form of an exam that the candidate receives. And for many people in many exam programs from a policy perspective, this becomes very important to have that consistent forward-facing cut score that's used consistently across the program despite the number of health checks and form reassemblies that may be occurring in the background. Quick slide here just to point to several of the references that we rely on um, a lot for kind of our psychometric perspective and grounding here at Alpine may be useful, probably things a lot of you guys already have on your bookshelves, um, but these are kind of go-to references that we tend to use and where a lot of the um, methodologies and, and grounding for our approach come from. So I just wanted to provide those to you in case you want to do any follow-up research after this presentation. And that's the end of my formal slide. I know I went through a lot really quickly, so I'm now open to answering any and all questions that have come in during the session. First of all, uh, thank you, Lisa. Excellent presentation, a lot of content. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we've got uh, only got one question so far, so if, uh, for those individuals that are uh, still holding on to their questions, please feel free to start submitting those. Uh, one of the questions that we had was, uh, what is the lowest item score correlation one should accept? That's a great question. Um, our approach to that at Alpine is actually looking at what we consider to be a critical correlation. And that takes into consideration not only your exam length, but also the average correlation of your items 
on your um, exam as a whole. And what that says for us is basically a, a baseline um, metric through which we compare individual items. Actually, let me go back to that slide and see if I can show you an example of what I'm talking about. But essentially what that creates for us is, as you can see here, the critical correlation to this exam was 0 0.54. So anything that was lower than that, would have been considered no correlation and anything that was negative, whenever anything is negative is outside the realm of, in this case, it would have been negative 0 0.54, um, that would have been considered negative correlation. What that allows you to do is it allows you to set a dynamic correlation through which you're comparing um, your individual items based on information of how your exam is actually performing as a whole. The danger with setting some type of a baseline like we never accept a correlation less than 0.1. Um, if it's not taking into consideration the overall reliability of that particular exam form and or the performance of your individual item. So using an approach such as setting that critical correlation, um, which, you know, we can set for our clients or there's some basic ways that you can actually go about doing that um, is, is one metric that you can use kind of from an exam to exam basis to figure out really what is appropriate for this exam. In general, as I realize that's not too helpful in terms of a useful applied answer, um, when evaluating items in situations where we need to include, let's say, less desirable items based on a limited item pool or a circumstance such as that, my key recommendation is focus on the flags that are the least offensive to your exam program. So in some circumstances, you may be in a situation where you know including items that are easier than 0.9 is not giving you a lot of information, but it's also not that egregious as an offense. You just know that most of your candidates are going to, let's say, get that item right. In that case, in limited item pool situations, my first flag I tend to loosen on is p-value, and I tend to loosen it first on the two easy side, going up to like 0.95. Again, they're just more filler items. Um, the only thing particularly wrong with those items, if that's the only flag it has, is you know that it's not giving you much information about your candidates, again, because most people are probably going to answer it correctly. The next flag that I go to is critical correlation, looking at those items that did not have any other flags. So in other words, I wouldn't consider an item that is too easy but also had a correlation flag, for example. But looking at those items that still have a positive correlation to your exam, but might just be slightly below what the critical correlation was. In those cases, depending on what my critical correlation is, I've been in situations where to meet blueprint restrictions, if that was what trumped over, let's say, really picking only the most solid batch of items, which is the types of trade-offs we all have to make all the time when we're making QQE decisions. Um, I've taken items that, that go down to, um, you know, a, a, a zero, a no, no correlation, 0.00. .00. Um, if at all possible in all situations, I avoid negative correlated items because they are typically indicative of something more dynamic, more dynamically wrong with the item than just it not being as strong as information driven of an item with other items. All right, we had, uh, <clears throat> we had another question come in. Uh, can you please define polytomous? Sure, yeah, and I apologize for not defining these, these terms up front. So dichotomous, um, I defined it quickly in, in the course. Dichotomous is a zero, one, incorrect, correct response answer to where it's only one point. Polytomous items are multi-point items um, in which you can score along a partial credit um, scoring model. So let's say it's a four-point item, you would be able to score zero, one, two, three, or four points, let's say, on that item. There's a third item type, which is multi-point dichotomous, in which case it's still a yes or no, incorrect or correct um, delivery, but it may be something like a two-point multi-point dichotomous, in which case a person could either score zero, they get the item incorrect, or two, if they get it correct, but they would not be awarded partial, partial credit or a one. Great, thank you. Well, we yeah, have... just extending that slightly, just real quick. Multiple choice items are typically zero-one dichotomous type items. 
Um, polytomous or multi-point dichotomous tend to be when we get into more performance-based items and or any um, essay-based items or anything that may require some type of a scoring rubric. Um, more uh, constructed response type items where individuals are actually having to produce something rather than just respond to a rote question that they're presented with. Our next question is regarding beta testing, what percentage of items would you expect to perform adequately to go operational? Can time and resources devoted to QC be lower when using beta testing? Sure. Um, our typical fallout rate and, and kind of the numbers that we overwrite to is typically 30%. Um, we, we typically gauge that um, within an item pool, there will probably be 70% of those items coming out of data that could be considered viable and strong. Um, it's important to keep in mind when you're doing any type of item writing and either bolstering or developing an item bank from scratch to keep the blueprint distribution in mind. So if you have, let's say, a five-section exam and, and your section one is heavily, more heavily weighted, it's important to overwrite more items to that section. Um, again, this will help control overlap right during your form assembly situation, and it'll actually eliminate perhaps a need to include less than desirable items um, in, let's say, that section where there really was a need for a lot more items than in the section that, let's say, had only 10% representation on the blueprint or something like that. And Shane, can you repeat the second part of the question? Uh, can time and resources devoted to quality control be lower when using beta testing? Sure, yeah. So in terms of, of beta testing and quality control, um, beta testing is a main QC factor. Um, I think it's important to consider it as a, a dynamic and comprehensive process, though. So while statistics may be one piece that you can typically look to, and of course I'm, I'm a statistical enthusiast, I think that there's strong information available through those, contextualizing the information that you're getting and actually going back and looping back with program sponsors and subject matter experts is critical to contextualizing the statistics that you're seeing. In other words, the numbers shouldn't operate in a bubble. We can come up with parameterizable flags that make sense to your exam program and the intended uses of your exam scores. Um, however, it really is important to sit back down with the experts in the area. Um, there may be, for example, an item that, that's really hard for candidates, so coming, with straight, coming out of straight statistics, we may recommend deleting that item. However, the subject matter expert may say, we understand this is really advanced contact, content, but it's critical um, that it be represented on um, this exam to be representative of the domain as a whole, in which case that item might get added back on for that key frequent representation. Um, so again, it's, it's important to kind of balance all of that when thinking about data sets. We're, uh, we're just about out of time, but we do have two last questions, so you, you might be able to speed through these as best you can. The first one is, uh, how do you handle low-volume exam statistics, like less than 25 examinees in one administration? Great question. Um, low-volume exams is something that um, we're constantly dealing with. Um, in terms of beta testing low-volume exams, that's a situation where an operational beta may be more appropriate than actually a beta test. Because again, you're going to be poaching your entire candidate pool by having the beta test. So running an operational beta exam in which only one operational form be released and candidates are receiving their scores as they're taking it, um, after which a certain number of candidates have taken it, you may be able to pull down that beta exam and release two operational parallel forms um, would be key. Certain statistics, the ROSH uh, model in particular, doesn't perform as well. It's not as stable in terms of its statistics when there's low volume, so that may be a situation where we're relying more on classical statistics rather than trying to also have the information from item response theory um, may be key. And I think it's important to remember that it doesn't eliminate the value of all statistics when you're in a low volume exam setting. You just need to keep in mind that the measurement error will increase. The variability in your statistics will be higher the fewer number of candidates that you have. So again, there is still value in the statistics but the contextualization of those statistics with your subject matter experts and with your exam program sponsors will increase as the volume of examples that you have of exam and item performance decrease. 
And our last question of the day, where can I find out more information about calculating an exam's critical correlation? Sure, if you want to talk critical correlation, um, I'm happy um, for anyone to email me directly. Um, I think Shane will be releasing, if it's not already out there, otherwise you can go on the Alpine website. Um, my email is just lisa.olary at alpinetesting.com. Um, in terms of references, um, it's not something that is kind of readily discussed in a, in a lot of the literature. I can certainly look to see um, if there's any kind of standing literature on it, um, but I'm happy to discuss um, the approach that we take here at Alpine to determine that on a one-on-one basis. Great. Well, first of all, uh, thank you again to Lisa for uh, spending the, the afternoon with us today. I think there was a lot of great questions and information given out, uh, as she just mentioned. Uh, if you have questions uh, specifically um, about the webinar, you're welcome to reach out to her. Uh, you can also send those questions to me, and I can direct them to the right folks. Uh, we are kind of wrapping up at this point. I would uh, encourage everybody, if you're interested in um, copyright issues within uh, the testing industry, uh, that is our next webinar. Uh, that will be hosted October 1st, again, the first uh, Wednesday of the month. Next month, uh, that uh, registration has been posted on the website now, so you're welcome to browse out to www.alpinetesting.com, uh, click on the newsroom link uh, in the top menu bar, and then uh, choose events, and you can register for that. Uh, that being said, thank you all again for your time today. Sorry we went over just a few minutes, uh, and I hope to see you on the call next month. Thanks, and have a great week.